I'll just like to uh, welcome you to V2, Institute for the Unstable Media. I'm Michelle Kasperzak, and this is the second edition of Blow Up. Blow Up is a series of events and exhibitions that explores contemporary questions from multiple viewpoints. We zoom in on ideas, bringing into focus clear pictures of how art, design, philosophy, and technology are transforming our lives or reinforcing the status quo. Alongside each event, a blow-up reader exploring the theme and texts from a wide range of sources will be released in ebook format. And you can download uh, the new edition on our website tonight. The PDF version is coming tomorrow, but tonight we have the uh, Kindle version and the uh, Adobe uh, Digital Edition version available. Tonight, we're looking at the idea of documentary and journalistic techniques in contemporary art practice, particularly the media arts. And we have three leading practitioners and thinkers with us tonight to explore this tension between art and communication, beauty and truth, a good story, and the real story. First off, we're going to hear from curator and writer Alfredo Cramarotti, author of the book Aesthetic Journalism. Next up will be Dutch artist and creator of PAPA, the participating artist press agency, Lino Hellings. And finally, Scottish artist and entropic modernist, Gare Dunlop. After these short talks, we're going to have a break where you're going to get to sample tonight's uh, bespoke cocktail and also experience a brand new uh, custom designed interface for interacting with the Papa imagery by uh, Rotterdam design agency, Not Deaf, which you can see over on that side of the room. Then we're going to come back around uh, and round out the evening with the European premiere of Gerrit Dunlop's film, Adam Town, Life After Technology, focusing on the history, myth, and mystery surrounding the Dune Ray reactor in rural Scotland. We're also streaming live tonight, so hello to our virtual uh, viewers. And please remember, if you do that sort of thing, to uh, tweet with the hashtag hashv2 underscore. So without anything further, I'd like to hand it over to Alfredo Cramarotti, and I'll just introduce him for you, give you a little bio. Uh, Alfredo is a writer, curator, editor, and artist working with TV, radio, publishing, internet, art exhibitions, festivals, and curating. He does it all, this guy. He was co-curator of Manifesta 8 and is curator at Quad, Derby's Center for Art, Media, and Film. He's also the editor of Criti Critical Photography at Intellect Books. He is the incoming director at Mostyn, the largest publicly funded contemporary art gallery in Wales. Welcome, Alfredo. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much for, to all of you. Um, thank you. It's really nice to, to, to be here in Rotterdam, actually. I spent some months in Rotterdam when I was studying here for the Pietro Art Institute, so a few years ago, actually, so it's, it's really nice to, to, to be back. Um, I guess, actually, my involvement here about the, the, the idea of art, as, as the title is, every artist is a journalist, about this relationship between art, journalism, uh, documentary, it's, uh, it has to do uh, with the fact that I'm uh, maybe an atypical curator in, 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 that, in that sense that I, I, I kind of uh, um, keep an eye, uh, an eye and a foot in art and, and a foot somewhere else. Um, so I'm, I'm really keen to, uh, to, to explore how art somehow interacts with, with our system that govern or facilitate our, our life. And um, I, I think it's, I, I have a passage also in, in the text I, I, I prepared actually about this. Um, I started actually to, to, to be interesting in this uh, well, I try to work all the time when, when there are some sort of alarm bells ringing, and I'm sure it happens to you as well, to all of you, and uh, uh, there is something that is ringing in your, in your head, and I try to understand what is ringing, and since some years now, since about 10 years, it's, it's uh, the idea of, uh, of the system of information, the information as such, but also the system uh, in which information is produced and distributed. Um, so it's more about... Um, the information, the, the communication of this information, and the aesthetics of this uh, communication ways, let's say. And, uh, and precisely, I have also uh, a, a starting point, which I, I remember very clearly. In, uh, I work as also as an artist, um, doing a lot of things, really. <laughs> um, and in 2003, I was commissioned to do uh, a, an artwork, which is kind of the, the usual type of commission you, you get it as an artist to, to, to do a work about a bridge in Istanbul connecting Asia and Europe, um, which is almost a shallow brief, I would say, I mean, without any, 
<laughs> any yeah, um, uh, reticence. And uh, so I invited a colleague, we went there, uh, we discovered there is no one bridge but two bridges actually connecting Asia and Europe and then we, we did our research, investigation, field work, interview and video and audio recording, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We went back, we realized first it was uh, um, an audio piece and then it became uh, uh, an audio installation and it became a video piece, three minutes. We presented it in an art gallery in, in Berlin, one one time in Copenhagen, it also went all well and uh, etc. Then I started to, to wonder why I was commissioned to do an artwork and I came back with some sort of a journalistic report. And, uh, and, uh, and I started precisely from then, it was 2002 basically, 2003. And I started to, to, to uh, question uh, my means of production actually. Uh, I thought it was important, I was, uh, I, I, I was pretty sure that uh, the, the, the approach was interesting, um, uh, but also uh, I, I wasn't really uh, aware about what critically I was doing with the means of production, so borrowing this sort of a journalistic documentary methodology and, and bringing it into art. Um, and so I developed this, this, this research, so to speak, uh, that it, it went through different, it's still ongoing really, and it went through different steps. So one is, you know, kind of a talks like this one and seminars and exhibition project, the book actually is, is one thing and then curatorial project, etc., etc. So and I'm still quite keen to the idea, I'm, I'm working a lot with photography now and the idea of expanded photography and uh, for me it's quite, it's quite interesting when I, when I uh, grasp something in my daily life that it has to do with this one and I try to translate it into uh, the context in which I work. Um, I, I don't manage all the time, really, especially kind of a running and working in a in a public institution. Uh, you have to balance your things, of course, <laughs> and uh, and it's fine. I mean, it's you know, it's a, it's a it's a way of using what you have, really, and in the most um, effective way. Um, for uh, um, tonight, I, uh, I I I did. Uh, thought actually to, to, to do um, a presentation and uh, I didn't want to, 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 to go into my old material really so I, I, I wrote something new um, which is actually uh, not completely mine. Um, it, it, it comes from a number of sources. Uh, it comes from uh, um, an article published on The Guardian, it comes from uh, uh, an, uh, a piece of an, an interview with an historian it comes from my own writing, from uh, um, the curatorial research I did with Simon Scheich for the a recent exhibition in, in, in Derby. Uh, it comes from um, another couple of articles in magazines and things like that. Um, so, and I, I think I will, I will read it. It's called uh, On Any Given Evening, like this one. The text, the different text, um, not in any order, so not in any particular order, are by Peter Schlidal, Fred Richkin, Alfredo Cramerotti, Jack Schenker, and Khaled Fami. Apologize, there's no women in that. I know, I'm aware about it. Naughty, naughty, naughty. On any given evening, Cairo Tahrir Square creaks under the weight of its own recent history. Trinket sellers flog martyrs' pendants. Veterans of the uprising hold up spent police bullets recover from the ground, and an ad hoc street cinema screens YouTube compilation of demonstrator and security forces clashing under clouds of tear gas. This is collective memory by the people, for the people, with no state functionaries around to curate what is remembered or forgotten. Egyptians are highly sensitive about official attempts to write history and create st state-sponsored narratives about historical events says Khaled Fami, one of the country's leading historians. When Hosni Mubarak was vice president in the 70s, he was himself on a government committee tasked with writing, or better, rewriting, the history of the 1952 revolution to suit the political purposes of the elite at that time. That's exactly the kind of thing we want to avoid. As visual regime, both the journalistic, historic, and the artistic documentary make claims for the truth. 
albeit of a different kind. The former is a coded system that speaks for the truth, or so it claims. The latter is a set of activities that question itself at every step, or so it claims, thus making truth. Throughout modern times, it has been of vital importance for journalists and historians that their reports are taken to be truthful through images, correct facts, and impartial wording. For the artist, it has been more important that she or he was true and authentic because it is increasingly difficult to look at something and safely identify it as art. The figure of the artist must appear as truthful and real as possible. Whereas journalism traditionally provides a view on the world out there, as it really is, art often presents a view on the view, pos positing truth through critical acts of self-reflection and auto-critique, or how information is produ produced and what it says, how information and images, I would say, is produced and what they say. It is useful to examine both activities as types of truth production, a system of information that define truth in terms of the visible, producing not only what can be seen, but also what can be imagined and thus imaged. Khaled Fami knows only too well about the inherent tension between acts of mass popular participation and official attempts to catalogue and record them. Less than a week after the fall of Mubarak, the professor received a phone call from the head of Egypt's National Archive asking him to oversee a unique new project that would document the country's dramatic political and social upheaval this year and make it available for generations of Egyptians to come. I was initially very reluctant, says for me. I didn't want people to think we were producing one definite narrative of the revolution. But then I started thinking about the possibilities and suddenly I got excited. Albert Einstein reportedly stated that we cannot solve our problems at the same level of thinking that generated them. If we open up and rethink our conception of traditional information formats, allowing imagination and open-endedness, we might perceive things in ways we remain unaware of. In aesthetically approach, approaching events in contemporary life, what appears to be real, true, or verifiable cannot be detached from the system of the representation adopted. This means we start to get closer to the core of reality itself when we make our reality not a given irreversible fact, but a possibility among many others. There are always stories to tell and many ways to tell them, but what is important is how we partake in this narration of the real and not just leave it to others. We do not only consume images and ideas, but also criticize them, and in turn, maybe make some of our own. The production of truth is a shared undertaking with vast political and social ramifications. A question at this point. Is a witness account which involves times and participation a viable substitute for a reporting position? A witnessing experience is centered on the issue of time. The fundamental difference between a journalistic work that reports and one that witnesses is in the approach of the producer to the mode of revelation that exposes and represents facts without anesthetizing them. This makes evident the paradox of mainstream journalism covering complex issues with 20 second sound bites in order to make them digestible for an audience. The same goes for the act of history making. And so the committee to document the 25th January Revolution was born. Staffed by volunteers and drawing on everything from official records and insurrectionary pamphlets to multimedia footage and updates on Twitter and Facebook, the project aims, in Fami's words, to gather as much primary data on the revolution as possible and deposit it in the archives so that Egyptians, now and in the future, can construct their own narratives about this pivotal period. The project would also collect hundreds of hours of recorded testimony from those involved in the struggle to bring down Mubarak, whether they would support the revolution or not. Here, it is not the simultaneity with the real that is important, nor its speed rate, but the development of an essence of reality, 
that works at the level of imagination. It constitutes the idea of participation of the user in the production of meaning. Is it possible to work with aesthetics and informatics to be both reflective and precise? To both employ documentary techniques and journalistic methods while remaining self-reflecting and critical on those means. Many have adopted the journal part of journalism as a personal vehicle. What happened in my, your day? What do I, you think? Or what the old journalism industry is telling us, etc. Part of this trend is due to the powerlessness that comes with being a rather passive recipient of news that one cannot do much about. A blog, for instance, give at least the illusion of impact and is usually less institutional and remote. It is an exercise fraught with difficulties, particularly at a time when the question of who gets to speak for a revolution is being bitterly contested on the street of Cairo and elsewhere. Documenting the revolution sounded like an easy thing, but what is the revolution? asked Fami. When did it start? When did it end? What constitutes participation in the revolution? Is it only those who went down to Tahrir? Or is it also the doctors who work extra long hours in their hospitals to treat the wounded? What about the police officer who fought the protesters? Is he a part of revolution or not? There is nothing academic or theoretical about those questions. Over the past five months, the ruling military junta has sought to limit the scope of the revolution both rhetorically and legally, applying the term strictly to the 18 days of street demonstration that led to Mubarak resignations and contrasting those selfless protests, protests with the disrupted and self-interested strikes and sit-ins held subsequently by workers and other groups demanding political change. This month has seen tens of thousands of protesters reoccupying Tahrir and other city centers around the country, arguing that the revolution has been hijacked by conservative forces and offering a powerful rejoinder to the army's claim that grassroots political struggle has now come to an end. It is a conflict over ownership of the process of revolutionary change, one that has already brought violence back to Egypt's streets and which Fami's project is wading straight into the middle of. Speaking the truth also means self-reflection and the willingness to disclose the position from where one is speaking and through which means and methods one is constructing the speaking of the truth. To speak the truth is also to speak the truth about oneself and one's act of speaking, thus exposing subject and object of the speech equally. In this light, I find it highly timely and pertinent to reflect the journalistic in the aesthetics and the aesthetics in the journalistic. We probably need a kind of knowledge looking beyond what is immediately visible, a latency, so to speak, an imaginative reading of what is not accessible to the senses. We could use the passage of time by applying an attentive eye to current and manifest aspect of the matter analyzed but also to the historical background that produced it, to what is concealed, concealed to the eye, that is, and to its possible or imaginary development. To pursue an aesthetic approach in a journalistic, documentary, or historic representation can reveal aspects of reality otherwise buried beneath real-time coverage of occurrences. It takes time to assess what could be true or false, right, or wrong, and ultimately to decide where one, as a viewer, reader, or user of information, stands in relation to ethical and aesthetic issues. On the day Fami met the Guardian, one of the committee's working groups has just decided to alter the start date of their inquiries, moving it from 14 January 2011 the day the Tunisian president Zine al Abidine Ben Ali was forced from office, back to June 2010, when the Alexandrian youth Khaled Said was killed in broad daylight by two police officers, an incident that mobilized many Egyptians against the Mubarak regime. The finish date of their project, the moment 
the committee formally considers the revolution to have ended remains the most controversial of all and is still up in the air. All the committee members who range from activists to bloggers to academics and politically conscious are politically conscious and we are aware that making these sorts of decisions is problematic, insists Fami. My own feeling is that the revolution is very much incomplete and the second stage, which requires overcoming the army, may prove even more difficult than the battle to topple Mubarak. It is a matter of adding knowledge, linking what we already know with what we don't know, we don't know and putting the new in sequence with other knowledge sharpening the existing ways of production and distribution of information, generating relations of mutual influence with other systems that govern or facilitate our life, like mass media, science, law, architecture, or other study and planning activities. Two aspects are equally important. For the authors not to be forced to adapt to the speed of the news industry, which subsequently tends to speed up, so to speak, the history-making process and for the users not to be required to accept or refuse the information on the spot. Be irreverent to the format of the reproduction of things. All these opportunities must be kept alive to eventually expand back into journalism, documentary, archives, and history making. But aside from reflecting the contested nature of post mubarak Egypt, FAMI believes his historical committee has another more subversive purpose. In common with most Arab countries, public access to official information in Egypt is almost non-existent, with state archives buried beneath a musty web of security restrictions and a deeply entrenched government culture of destroying or hiding any records that could broke or court. But FAMI hopes this latest initiative could herald a fundamental change in the way Egyptians view their relation with state information and by extension their relation with the state itself. It is people who make history, not generals or leaders, says Fami. But it is, if it is the people who make history, then they should be this, the ones who write it and read it as well. From the very beginning he has insisted that all material collated by his committee must be publicly accessible to anyone on the internet. That decision breaks a mold of state secrecy that has prevailed for decades. Today, anybody wishing to research, say, 18th century Egyptian ports must still submit themselves first for interrogation at the Ministry of Defense. FAMI's committee is not the only group attempting to pry open a long-held tradition of official concealment. Within a few weeks of Mubarak fall, Protesters had ransacked the headquarters of Egypt's notorious state security service, looting thousands of classified documents and placing many of them online. Last month, the country's first freedom of information law was drawn up, though there is no guarantee it will make it on the status books. What counts is the position of perennial rework, research and reading of things, avoiding what we could call the statement of reality. It requires us to suspend our notion of the experienced as something fixed and immutable. This attitude does not create fiction, but changes the mode of reading facts. The question of access of, to information and archives is political because reading history is interpreting history, and interpreting history is one way of making it adds Fami. Closing people off from the sources of their own history is a, an inherently political gesture and equally opening that up is a political, even revolutionary act. What we are is attributed by others, what we see by ourselves. To grant the idea of reality in its reception rather than its representation is one way to retain the ability to build our own truth claim for what is represented, instead of the material making such claims for itself. But despite all the institutional obstacles, FAMI is certain that the size and nature of this year revolt means there can be no going back to the days when Egyptians were severed 
from the, de from the deliberation and documents of those ruling in their name. This was a leaderless revolution and one which came about through mass participation, he explains. The way we write history now has to be part of the same process and so that's the way we access that history. That for me is as much as part of the revolution as anything else. By combining documents and imagination, the necessity of the former with the desire of the latter, we create almost an antidote to the often senseless accumulation of information. This would counter the attempt to be objective at all costs and would not discard creativity in favor of neutrality. It does not mean telling fancy stories. It means undoing the connection between things, signs and images, which constitute what we intend as reality, sharpen and rendering more persistent our curiosity and more visible the contours of the environment where we live. It should furnish life with something more and better than we expect from life without it. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, maybe we can launch right into talking about this particular example that you've chosen to highlight. I mean, um, your book, which is available at the, at the book station back there, and if anyone wants to check it out, but also there's lots of information online, covers many different examples. Not all of them is overtly political as the, um, the example that you've chosen to highlight tonight. Tell us a little more about the, your, your curation of your talk uh, this evening. You will. I was interesting in the. Uh, I was actually um, very curious the, the the way you term the way documentary as an element in between art and journalism, uh, which uh, is new to me somehow because I uh, usually uh, when we talk about documentary we always associate it with some sort of a, a fact of journalistic way. It's not really uh, much associated with art, which somehow it should, to my opinion. And uh, the, the terms documentary comes from document, document in terms of from a, it comes from a certification of a fact somehow. So you are supposed to have something, a body or whatever, who certify that there is a fact. So it becomes a document and then it becomes a documentary based on those documents. And, uh, and the process, I was interested in the process of history making precisely because it used a lot of documents or so certified as documents. And uh, to pick up one example, very, very current, I would say, like Egyptian revolution, and, uh, and to understand how the process of history making of this revolution is taking place, I thought it was very, very relevant. Um, but I wasn't happy as well with only uh, putting up there this account of this committee for the 25th January revolution. So I mix it up with a lot of other texts, my texts, uh, some other people's texts, um, where I, I, I thought uh, it could fit somehow. And uh, inserting some sort of a fictional element and some blurry lines uh, about this account. Um, and, and to some extent, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's in line with what I'm preaching. <laughs> I'm not preaching, actually, but I'm, I'm trying to enact. That's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always um, very useful to be aware about uh, the, the degree of, of, of fiction that we have. And, uh, you know, that's, I can experience something firsthand, and it, it's a reality to me, it's a truth to me. And as soon as I tell you, it becomes something else for you. That doesn't mean that everything is fiction, and that doesn't mean that, you know, the, uh, we have this postmodern approach that uh, we live in a lie or in a bubble. It means to be transparent about the account you make. It means to be very clear about the position where you are and where you stand. And, and there's nothing wrong to say, okay, this is my point of view and it's totally fictional or it's real for me. But then, you know, this, use it as a tool for you. And that's why it comes from this one. And yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I liked what you said uh, at one point. Uh, who decides where the revolution starts and where it ends and talking about these start dates and end dates. And I mean, this is something whenever you're looking at narrowing down on a subject, you have to always, yeah, consider what you're looking at. I mean, uh, Lino, you're gonna talk next about Papa, but it's like you have to pick a city, 
decide, you know, pick your collaborators, decide on things. Decisions have to be made. You can't just say this is, a, this is about everything. Um, we're all, in a sense, uh, artists are acting, uh, you know, in a very selective way, how they, how they represent the information, uh, what they're choosing to do. And, of course, uh, w what you were saying about documents compl complicates matters because, for example, you mentioned Twitter as well, and it's, you know, I mean, the Library of Congress in the United States is now archiving all public tweets. This is, you know, so much stuff and nonsense. This is, you know, a lot of uh, talk about peanut butter sandwiches. This is, you know, this is not valuable information really to, to anyone in a way, but they had to cast this big net in order to, they didn't dare curate it. And that's something that, that often happens with, with archives as well, where you don't, so my question I suppose is, or what I'm trying to get to is that um, it's interesting when we decide to curate or select and when we don't. Um, for example, a few years ago in Dundee where uh, Gare spends a lot of his time. I was at a, a conference about, uh, about archiving and uh, a fellow from the University of St. Andrews had a large collection, lots of duplicates in this uh, collection of photography, a lot of damaged slides, a lot of uh, damaged things. And I asked him if he was going to take the duplicates out, maybe do some touching up, clean up the images. Oh, no, 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 you know, it must remain exactly as they are. As they are. Yeah. You know, so. I mean, where does the... Uh, well, I think it's simply a matter of, uh, um, A, uh, I guess, I don't know, um, um, from my point of view at least, uh, I'm not so interested in creating some sort of a create new knowledge, for instance, mm -hmm. about a subject or a matter. I'm more interested in um, kind of a shifting ways of knowledge. So uh, basically combine knowledge with other knowledge, so creating, shifting the modes of, of, of acquiring those knowledge. Uh, because, as you say, probably we, we live in such a su information-saturated world that we probably don't need any other information. I mean, uh, that there is information comes to us, so it's, it's really a matter of not just not just filtering, but making sense, which is different than filtering. It's, it's make, it means about curating some of this information that you gather, and it's not just about the curator's job. It's about everyone's life, really, because in, in everyone in, in his or her own life is that we select a number of information that are useful and you make something with that information. So it's more about create, uh, creating awareness about this process. And in terms of history making, for instance, I'm really interested in uh, this idea of keeping history and history making in suspension, in a state of suspension, um, which is frightening on one side because uh, you will never get to any conclusion. And on the other side is also uh, exciting precisely because you don't get any conclusion, you always have the possibility to reshuffle the knowledge that you gather through uh, the historical documents and things like that. Um, so f it's, it's really a matter of, uh, I think art in this sense, it can be a very useful tool not to uh, replace journalism, not to replace documentary, but to help to understand those activities. Um, because it has a different time approach, it has a different uh, critical attitude towards the thing that they are involved. So I would, s I'm not scared to say, well, I think uh, art, it, uh, it should be almost at the service of the other um, kind of activities and, uh, and, 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 and practices and, 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 and job we do. And, uh, and when I, when I curate something like the Reading Manifesto, for instance, I, I commission a number of artists to work with TV and, and radio and newspapers. It was very um, challenging because you push artists out, outside their comfort zone, and I push myself out of my comfort zone. And uh, you know, when, you, when you create a media platform, you work with them, not against them, not for them, but with them. It just destabilized the whole institutional and artistic approach you are used to do it. Um, but I think it's useful. It, art should, I'm, I think it should, <laughs> it's a strong word, but I think it, it, it should enter some sort of a mutual dependency into a mutual dependency with other systems of our life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why I think I got the buzz in the morning to get out of the bed and do something really. Um, yeah, and it also comes back to something else that you mentioned, which was who has the power to speak. and. Um, and this this notion of who, who who's on the, who's on stage, 
um, which is something I hope you'll also mention, um, Lino, because we talk about majority world and who's on stage in, in, in our conversations. And uh, yeah, and this, this obviously plays a massive role. I mean, and as, as curators, we have a huge influence in who gets to be on stage, and that's a huge responsibility, and I don't know if it's one that we talk about enough, it, uh, but um, artists, too, uh, have, a, have a kind of power that they have to think about as well through the, the, the cumulative effect of what they develop over their career as well. I think it's the most useful people in the world, artists, really. So I'm really happy if I can help, this, if I can help yes. artists to realize what they do. Um, Okay. Uh, yes, I think uh, one thing that maybe artists are uh, a bit reticent is, is actually to engage with these other systems somehow mm. because it's, um, there is a lot of uh, um, urgencies into the arts and, uh, and, and art will take upon urgencies, so to speak, an important and relevant question, but then as long as they remain into the artistic field, it's, it's all right because it's a, it's a globalized circuit, it's a, it's a network circuit, it's, it's also a niche circuit. So it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, very, it's very interesting when some artists are trying to develop works for the artistic environment, but also for something else, being that a, a newspaper, a science lab or whatever. I mean, then because it becomes very effective for those sorts of uh, um, audiences, which are not necessarily involved in any way with art. Well, I find usually artists are willing to engage with other systems, but other systems maybe are not as They're very scary, some friendly systems, to artists. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, they're but very scary. And uh, there's a lot of, there is a lot of um, compromise going on as well. When, yeah. you, when you go step outside your comfort area, mm -hmm. I, as a curator, but also as a, as, a, as, a, as a curator, director of an art institution, I do a lot of compromises. And, uh, well, we all do in our lives, so I, I, I don't see any problem with that. And I know that uh, I'm doing the, uh, as far as, you know, your goal is, is, is kind of a aim into a direction, and then it's all right to compromise your work, I mean, for me. <laughs> well, let's ask the artists what they think. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> right, so now we're going to move on to uh, Lino. So if we could uh, get your slides up. You, sorry? Oh, okay, she needs a little time. Arms and hands. Well, we'll uh, I'll just give you time to use your own, yeah. Anyways, and uh, I'll introduce uh, Lino. She's an artist and founder of the legendary theater company Dog Troop, which investigated public space in specific locations, as Papa does today. Though Dog Troop's purpose was not to make news, but spectacle theater. As public spaces in Western cities began to look more and more alike, uh, Lino left Dog Troop after 17 years to focus on the new public space of the internet. And I'm going to leave it there, and you can tell us all about uh, Papa, which came kind of after that initial period of getting into exploring the public space of the internet. Yeah, I left Dog Troop in 92, so that's quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, but it's, this is the background. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what you see here is the, the process I designed. Papa is still in development, and I think it will never be finished. But this uh, drawing I made somewhere at the end of 2009, uh, what you see on the that side, uh, I got the idea in 2006. I, I've been working as a theater artist for 17 years. Then I was in individual artists making art for public spaces like hospitals and railway stations, etc. In 2006, I decided to again change my work because I found public space is not limited to the borders of Holland. We're all connected now. And I very much like the research aspect of my work. So uh, in 2006, I, I got this idea to start an artist press agency where in principle we work together but everybody stays in his or her, her own country. And uh, just after I had I, that idea, I, I went to a uh, photo festival in the north of Holland called Noorderlicht. And there I found a uh, press agency in Bangladesh. Uh, and that was exactly what I meant. So I thought I got to go there. And that's what I did. It took two years, but I went to uh, Bangladesh to this press agency called DRIC as an 
I went there as an artist in resident and I told them I was going to spread a new human right and human right was called errorism. Uh, the right to make mistakes because I thought if in Bangladesh of all countries people understand the fun of errorism then my idea of starting a press agency with artists has a ground. Well, they understood that very well. So I came back and I decided I'm going to continue this. I, I had a lot of talks with people and anyway, we changed the name in Papa because, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Papa is Participating Artists Press Agency. And uh, I, I looked for funding to have me build up Papa bottom up working with artists and photographers in the New Yorks of the world. So I started in, in September 2009, I went to Lagos, Nigeria. I worked with local photographers, most of them internationally acclaimed artists, by the way. Then I went to Sao Paulo. Then I came to Rotterdam. And last uh, spring, I went to Kyrgyzstan. I was supposed to go one year before, but that was just when the revolution, the second one, went on. And before these two years were ended, uh, which I had taken and programmed to design Papa, I already had two commissions, which was really nice. One was of the city of The Hague. The city of The Hague asked me to uh, make uh, clear the DNA of the, the flyovers, the Prince Klausplein. So these are seven flyovers. And uh, I worked with three artists in Holland, but I sent my correspondence in Bangladesh, in Nigeria, and Sao Paulo also to, to the flyovers, and they went there, and this was what we presented to the city of The Hague. So the city of The Hague has a lot of new business concepts for flyovers and how to use them. Another project which I initiated myself was uh, done in Rotterdam in November uh, last year. It was called Migration Papa, and uh, I was uh, with another journalist in the Tarwewijk, which is the, the port of the, for the migrants in, in, in Holland. It's an idea of Jan Konings. He found out that people fly into Schiphol, take the train to Rotterdam, the metro to the Maashaven, and then you walk in this little triangle of the Tarwewijk. And I sent my correspondence in Detroit, Sao Paulo, uh, Dhaka and Lagos also to, the, to these places where the newcomers arrive. And that was the second time Papa worked as I intended. And uh, the principles of Papa now are very, very simple. So it works, uh, we work in photo walks, which means you go out your own door or you go to a flyover or to an, an area where the migrants live, where the newcomers come in, and you just go out to get to picture what catches the eye. So you have no preconceived idea, no agenda, just what, uh, like picking berries in the wood, you picture what catches the eye. And then you go back home, and we do that in all the cities, more or less, well, we do it on the same day, but there's this huge time difference, so it's a bit of wave around the world. And then we block we, f we have a shared photo blog, so everybody puts two pictures a day for uh, uh, the whole week. And then we go out another time and another time. Um, the, the text you write on the internet is also very simple. You read the picture uh, aloud to a person on the other side of the world. Um, then we have the material on the website but it also takes many other forms. It's like, it works like an, uh, a photo stock. So we sell photo essays we, uh, to nice books which V2 makes, like the politics of the impure. Uh, we make exhibitions. Uh, I'm making a Papa book from the whole uh, of the six projects. But now I will take you through uh, some of the imagery. Um, I'm ordering it to be be published in the book, and this is part of what I'm sorting out. So in Papa, it's all about street-level observations. Like, for example, this one. This is in Sao Paulo. This is Sunday morning cleaning. This is how you clean your shop without actually opening it. 
You see, it's all different photographers. This is in Lagos. In Lagos, Nigeria, everybody knows if you put a plastic container on the roof of your car, your car is for sale. So in, in old days, they wrote on it for sale, but now everybody knows. This is in Rotterdam. This is called Let's Go Shopping. And it tells us that this car cost about 600 euros. This is all about reading public space. This is an, an, a newcomer's house, a, a, a living room and a bedroom in Lagos, Nigeria. This is in The Hague, in near the Prince Klaus flyovers. It's the vegetable gardens. And it's a very funny area around this Prince Klaus flyover because there are very sharp cuts between, for example, the golf course. I'm standing on the golf course picturing this vegetable gardens and the people on the golf course ask, uh, is it for funda? Which is <laughs> like when you want to sell your house. And they, they also call this whole area Soweto. Uh, this is in Sao Paulo and uh, this is a mobile slum. And we've even seen them a lot bigger. So people pack up their whole uh, house and move from one side to the other. And on the wall is written, in days of storm. This is also in Sao Paulo and the big blue chair is for patients, people with obesitas. It says a little note above the chair, it says reserved for obesitas people. So there are a lot of connections between the cities which you can read on the skin so there is almost everywhere a public telephone book. This is call a cab in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And by the way, a lot of this imagery on the rickshaws is now uh, designed with Photoshop. This is in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. It's uh, looking for a job. And in Kyrgyzstan, people also want to develop themselves so there is this uh, pink note saying hot English. So there are hot English courses and, and here around the corner is also a pink house where you can have these courses and that's what writes on the wall, it says hot English. So this person really needs some extra lessons, we think. This is in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, it says welder is here and you can call the welder or the web designer. And this is how it works. People in Lagos have like up to four or five businesses, so they also have like four or five telephones. So for each business, they take another telephone. This is in Sao Paulo, and you can see how sophisticated it is in Sao Paulo because this is, uh, it's called Big Ear, it's a public telephone. And there's especially one for handicapped, for people in wheelchairs. And also around these uh, big ears, there is the, are the yellow tiles for people, blind people, so they know they're near a telephone. But I'm more interested in the, in the, the open ear, and that's where you find the public telephone book of Sao Paulo. So all telephones in Sao Paulo are, have the, all these stickers. It's all ladies you can phone. And sometimes the ladies are men. But you see all the Katyas and Sonyas. And a lot of cities are in a kind of constant demolish and rebuild, like we all know about Rotterdam. But we find it also in, like in Sao Paulo. The center of Sao Paulo used to be a very posh area, but then all the posh houses became offices. And this area was uh, empty in the evening, so a lot of uh, homeless people start living there, and now it's called Krekolandia, like crack. And uh, what the government does is just wipes away all the houses and, and builds new ones to move this problem away. This is in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. It used to be a, a, a four-story. Uh, marketplace, but now it's only one story and they put this roof because they're also going to make a huge shopping mall there. 
The same happens in, in Bishkek. This is the poster of a uh, political party called Republic. And in the, uh, the, the uh, one of the people of this political party started building this huge shopping mall and casino, but there was a revolution and politics never stayed the same. So this is there since 2005, I think. This is Rotterdam. And uh, it's again making a new heart. So the, the photographer of this picture describes that he's standing with this building which he sees in front, but then it's in his back in real. And he's looking at this big bird and this 50 feet lady. So in the beginning with Papa, in the very beginning I thought I'm going to make an artist press agency that that makes news by taking action. So I thought I'm going to organize news and, and let wondrous things happen at unexpected places and then the, the big news will pick it up. But by traveling I found out that that's not necessary at all because everywhere there, there, there is this creativity of the millions and as an artist you can't beat that. I mean you can't invent better things than are already there. So if Papa has a theme, then it would be how people cope in life. This is in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan again. And uh, everywhere in the world people wear t-shirts with text and I sometimes ask myself whether they know what it says. Because in Bishkek one of the things is that there's a, a huge brain drain and, and people start working abroad and one of the dramas is that people in Kyrgyzstan think uh, their fathers or husbands have had this very rich life in America and they spent all the money and when the man comes back after 10 years then all this money is spent and they're all poor so that's lost in the West. This is in uh, Bangladesh, this is what people wear a, a little, little piece of Koran around their neck. This is Detroit. This, is, this man is the only one who, who still lives there. So in Detroit is a shrinking city like I think 80 or 90 percent of the people has left already. So that's why most people take a dog. This is Bishkek again. This is uh, expensive traditions. So the, uh, if you marry or if one of your persons in your family die, you are obliged to make huge parties, even not one, but repeat them a few years after each other. And it got so extreme that there is now a law uh, in preparation which uh, forbids people to organize parties with more than 25 people. Because it's really making the country kind of corrupt, they explained me. This is also Bishkek. This is an old Soviet tradition. It's called Subotnik. And it means that everybody in springtime has to clean his surroundings. But it's really everybody because when you walk around the hospital, then you also see the doctors and the nurses painting trees and clearing up. This is in Sao Paulo under uh, a flyover. These are catedores. These are people who uh, uh, get uh, from the streets the recyclable uh, materials and this is a very high specialized business. Uh, you see on the side of the car all the different ribbons etc. But these people can split 125 different sorts of plastics. Uh, we have now in Holland I think a robot who can split eight different sorts and then you have to throw all your garbage in. Um, they're also they're organized as a collective and they uh, have like all equal rights. So it's a very high organized form of informality, in fact, which is very Brazilian. The Brazilian have a very inclination. <coughs> this is Rotterdam. This is called the Street Factory. And it's, and here is, uh, they educate uh, street boys. They still have families, but they live in the street and they cause a lot of trouble in the streets. They are educated as uh, carpenters for half a year. So this tells a lot about our, all our systems of uh, help. This also Rotterdam. So what I found in other countries as like uh, 
low overhead jobs. Uh, you can find here in kind of uh, these kind of signs. It says it's forbidden in the street to sell car. And it's somewhere this in this of that and that law. This is in Lagos, Nigeria. It's, it uh, tells another story because when the photographer made this picture, I, I didn't understand wh but what's the story about it because I tell them you picture whatever catches the eye, which are details with a story. So when you see a detail and you, you know a story to tell, so I couldn't understand, but then he was saying uh, really like, but don't you understand, this is Oyo, it's on your own. It's the main concept of Nigeria because there are no, not any uh, sustaining systems. Uh, uh, you, there are no insurances. The, the, the photographers, they have to help each other on their jobs. And he said there are a lot of different OYOs. This is a car park OYO, but you also have a riot OYO if you are with photojournalist and, and one of the photojournalists goes towards the riot, then he is a riot OYO. You, you must know it yourself, you're on your own. But you can also be a pizza OYO if the family eats pizza and you don't want to. The Nigerians have a lot of acronyms to cope in life. So this is called uh, FRAN, it's Free Readers Association Nigeria. That is when you read a newspaper without actually buying it. And for the GSM, they said, say general street madness. This is Rotterdam again, because one of the acronym, acronyms in Nigeria is NCNC, which has something to do with the connections between Nigeria and Cameroon. And it says no contribution, no consumption. And when I, what I found out in Holland, it's the only place I've seen people eating in the streets that we are really brought up with the idea of no consumption. If we don't consume, then there will be no production. So it's completely the other way around. This is some of the pictures we took in different city about newcomers. And then we see that migration is like a circle. This is Detroit and here the Polish shop is closed. And here in Rotterdam, there's a new one opened. This is also around the corner here. It's uh, a shop where you can, in Rotterdam, where you can get real Brazilian hair. And this is in Brazil, where this Chinese lead lady got a real Brazilian bottom. So, in fact, we are all mingling already. Well, I discovered this press agency uh, Drick in Bangladesh by going to Noorderlicht in 2006 and now Papa, this year is Papa part of uh, the Noorderlicht exhibition and the di director of this press agency in Bangladesh is one of the photographers. So you see a picture on this uh, screenshot of a public bedroom picture he took in Bangladesh. And uh, together with the guys of Not Deaf, which are sitting in the back and which will show you something later, we make an um, exhibition which is like an installation. It's, a, it's the stills of public bedrooms, people sleeping in public space, which are also in the book, The Politics of the Impure, together with uh, beamed images from the whole PAPA website and objects. So it's uh, not deaf, uh, will also put objects there, so it's almost like you want to use it as your public bedroom. So the, in, in a way the circle is, is round, but the process will go on. And uh, with not deaf we will explain a bit later what they are um, developing for Papa. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I wondered if you could maybe uh, explain uh, a little bit more in terms of, you've, uh, you've got this great overview of uh, all the projects and uh, you're able to make these wonderful links between um, things that might seem funny or absurd uh, in one context, but you can actually see uh, an analogous situation 
uh, even here in, uh, in Rotterdam. Um, what do you think, or what have your conversations been uh, with the photographers that are all over the world? Like, do they get the same insights that you, that you have from, you have a sort of overview, but do they get the same thing, uh, being nodes in your network? Yeah, so, um, especially the very, uh, the very experienced photojournalists have, in the beginning, a difficulty with the way Papa works. So this uh, director of the press agency in Bangladesh, I, uh, I, he was involved in the two Papa projects, first with the flyovers, and I really had to convince him that it's really the idea to go out and picture what catches the eye. With the flyovers, he said, well, there is a flyover, but there's nothing there. And I said, well, just go there and have a look. And then he came up with the most incredible pictures. For example, there's one picture with the flyover in, in, in Dakar with a, a, a loving, with a couple standing on the flyover. It's called Lover's Lane. And in the text, he explains that uh, people are working uh, such long hours and they live with 15 people in two rooms. So the only place where they, the couples can walk is on the flyover. So and you, you can't think that uh, from the beforehand. You really can only find it. And then when we had the second uh, project, Migration Papa, then again he asked me, well, uh, what story do you want me to cover? I said, I don't want you to cover a story. I just want you to go there and picture what get, catches your eye. And well, we really had to Skype about it and I really had to write it down and then he trusted it. And he said he never in his life had uh, a paid commission to go out and picture what catches the eye. And a lot comes out. And what was his reaction to the images that the other photographers took? Did you talk about it at all? In no. the flyover project? In, no, no, no. no. Uh, they see everybody puts his or her pictures uh, to a day. So you see uh, each other's pictures. and. And after one or two days, the pictures start influencing each other. For example, uh, in this migration project, uh, the, the photographer in, in, Bang of in Lagos in Nigeria, he put out a picture of uh, a barbershop, which in Nigeria is a table and a few pictures of the different kinds of hair and, and a comb and, a, and, and a scissors. And he says he found that word low overhead. He says, well, it's your typical newcomer's job because you only need this and this and everybody wants to look nice. And then the, the barbershops came from all the places, from Dhaka and from Rotterdam in this Tarwewijk. I also find like 14 or 15 barbershops. So it's because you put the pictures out on a daily basis, it starts uh, finding each other. Right, so it's a visual conversation. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, not a kind of... You're not on Skype talking to each other about it, but no. you're... Yeah. We, there was one, one moment we started to talk about the word newcomer, because in Holland you can't ask a person where, is he, where he's from. Because that's, well, it it's, it's makes people feel uneasy. And then in the other countries they said, oh, how strange. That's, but in principle it's a visual conversation with this little text explaining what you see. And the experience of the photographers obviously is is different. So with Drick, that was like they were really experienced photojournalists. Maybe if you could tell us a bit about the like how the photographers react to that brief. The experienced ones are a little surprised. Um, yeah. The inexperienced ones just take it on board. No, it was. I was a bit scared when I went to Kyrgyzstan because there I worked with students of uh, an organization called Art East, and there were people who never had taken any photograph. So I had to bring cameras, and I thought, oh, wow, now I have this World Press photo, uh, famous people in my network, how will this work out? And uh, what I do, I never explain anything. I just arrive, and we just go out the door of the arts uh, place where mostly are art centers. And we don't go to any special place. We just go out the door, and this is one only commission is picture what catches the eye. And then uh, we found that people who had never made one photograph in their life could make pictures which match up with these pictures of the professional photographers because th these observations were so clear 
that great pictures came out, which was a surprise for me as well. And when they went out a week later, uh, and, want, and they were quite shocked, uh, the people in Kyrgyzstan, with the image they gave, because it was a black and white world, it was snowing, and, and they w thought it was all so gray, and then they, one week later they tried to make it look colorful, and then it was all gone, the quality in the pictures. And uh, the reactions of people that are uh, living in these places to the, to the way that their, uh, their city is portrayed, is there, I mean, we're seeing here the pictures of Rotterdam are, you know, it's not particularly glamorizing Rotterdam, it's not, uh, but they're just honest uh, pictures by, by people who, who live here. Is there any tensions there that uh, come up? Uh, I don't know, we have only shown it once, not deaf made for Papa and a uh, beautiful beamed uh, exhibition on the big windows of Atelier Tarawijk is in front of the Maashaven. And uh, because we uh, beam the pictures from the six cities next to each other, then uh, uh, the context become, becomes so wide that you don't, I don't think you feel ashamed for your own city or whatever. It, it's, it becomes another story. It makes it, in a way, glamorous, I think, for uh, this little uh, corner of Rotterdam to be compared with Detroit or Dhaka or Lagos. Or so I'm just remembering, once you told me about Sao Paulo, they had a few questions about it. It's the photographers themselves who are shocked with the images they take. And, and, and they, they have an, a set idea of their city. For example, the people in Sao Paulo think their Sao Paulo is a gray city. And, and uh, so there is always this friction when you pick to what, what catches the eye, then maybe something different comes out than what your idea was on the beforehand. So they have this conversation with me, what is the real Sao Paulo? And they were also the photographers in Sao Paulo were desaturating their pictures because they thought Sao Paulo is gray, so I forbid <laughs> them to do that. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Lino. We're going to move on. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, Ger, you're up. Uh, Ger Dunlop is uh, an artist who, uh, who explores entropic modernism, which I'm going to maybe get you to uh, define for people or, or at least uh, explain a little bit more about what that means. But... Uh, to give you an, an idea, it, uh, he's looked into the new town, the military airfield, the film archive, and the memory of progress. Final results vary from websites to handmade books, lawn drawings to expanded cinema events. He uses digital technologies, digital video, archive material, photography, and interactive technology in combination with site-specific practices and with remnants of the technological sublime on-site and online. Take it okay. away. Um, well, entropic modernism, that idea came to me through growing up in modernism. I grew up in a new town near Glasgow called Cumbernauld, where some extraordinary architectural experiments in megastructure took place. The center was this enormous linear structure. By conventional terms, it was not very well built, but it was incredibly ambitious. And the housing around this was there was something strangely flawed about Glasgow's development plans. They decided to rebuild the city by exporting all their skilled workers to a town 12 miles away. And that's, that seems to be how Glasgow is. But the point is, modernism for me is something I grew up in. It's not something kind of clean and pristine. It's something that's quite broken, that suffers from all kinds of cracked concrete. And there is still an appeal about modernism that transcends the, the wreckage that some of it has become. And I think a, a, another factor that's helped my work is there's a certain tradition of the documentary which doesn't necessarily come from journalism. It actually comes from a certain era of state sponsorship, but also um, commercial sponsorship. Um, I'm thinking of you know, the poetic documentary, if you like, of people like Humphrey Jennings. And, you know, those, I mean, 
everyone kind of thinks that they, they just made those films, but they were actually propaganda, and they, were all, they, they originally started with something called the Empire Marketing Board. But so the, the roots of documentary in Britain are actually very, very entwined with state structures, and they're very, very tied up with commercial interests too. But nonetheless, a lot of really interesting and poetic filmmakers have managed to come to sort of accommodation with that. And their stuff's now gone into public archives. And in a sense, I, I'm looking at the kind of, uh, once the embers of the news has died from this material, and you know it's kind of forgotten there, it's been moldering, and you can come back in, and what, what do these fantasies about, the pa about what the future is going to be like tell us about how we're actually living? Um, I'll just play you a little sound clip, if you like. This is, a, this is a, some hacked up segments from different thematics about films about tomorrow. Then they, they date from about 1930 to about 1970, so I'll just find that. That's a weather balloon that's exploded on Gare's desktop. The stuff of a new age in which lightness and high speed are the new master. The idea was this. Time moves on. In town and country, extraordinary things happen. Changes take place overnight. A continuing effort is made to link the PSYOP program with progress to help the people help themselves. This makes them see the military and the government as positive images, benevolent symbols, signifying steps toward a better life. A place to live and a place to work. A center for success. Slums, run-down factories, outworn ideas must be swept away. There's just got to be a house you like. In the period we are talking about, people will become very much more mobile. We shall all own motor cars. Psychological operations? Very well, sir. The small car is the symbol of this new revolution, the mobile revolution, and of the new freedom. The freedom of Mr. and Mrs. Everyman to delight in their heritage. Yes, 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 yes. Even the humble aristocrat of traditional Scottish foods, the oat cake, has to move with the time and has never tasted better. Can you grab your mic, sorry, for the stream? Streamers yeah, can't, hear, can't hear you. Yep. That's a little sample of the kinds of sounds of the future as inflected through a particular kind of documentary film. And I think by looking at some of these films and the gaps and the repetitions in some of them, we can find out a lot about how we managed to develop the idea of progress and, in a sense, how it's got us to where we are today. And that particular, um, those, those particular segments we, we, I built into, uh, along with another artist, Dan Norton, we built a thing called the Tomorrow's Project. And what we wanted to do with that, if I can just, oh, there we go. What I wanted to do is to allow people to gather clips themselves from ideas of the future and maybe try and mix them themselves. So this is online, anyone can find it. So there is, kind of 
very, very relaxed control. There are thematics. Here's a future in which priests come down beautiful elevated walkways, people walk through town centres, and you arrive at ring roads that are not yet finished. And indeed, it was only just finished last year, despite the, finish, the film being made in 1968. So you, you can mix your own future out of this. It never comes out quite the same way twice. Indeed, I haven't been on it for a little while. I'm not as fluid on it as I am. I can't quite remember what everything is anymore. So it kind of, we wanted an interface which kind of amplified people's existing relation to technology that if you didn't quite know how to operate a website, you'd be even worse with this. But if you did kind of get, if you could actually start to understand the iterative processes involved, you could actually start to take control of this sense of tomorrow a little bit. So I think, that, I think that's quite an interesting thing that some people will respond to playing with progress and we, we wanted to have a tool that people could do that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit before, before, we'll be showing the rest of the film later tonight, but I wanted to, show you a couple of little segments from the archive, which I find, to, they're talk, it's about how the way ideology works, if you like. This is a little clip from 1964. This is a film called, um, oh God, what, what was the first one called? Um, These are the Dune Ray clips now? Yeah, they're, 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 anyway. So I'll tell us a little bit about the project, actually, the film first. Okay. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time in my youth um, protesting against nuclear power stations and climbing fences and getting in and I never got arrested, I don't know how. And I just, eventually I thought, well, what exactly is in these places? What are the tales of the people who are in there? And after a great deal of um, kind of knocking at the gates and, you know, trying to find out who to talk to, I, I did actually get in. And I found, first of all, a lot of material at Scottish Television Archive. And this first one is, is a film they made in 1964. It's called The Powerhouse. That's it. I'll just quickly show you this. All over the atomic establishment, in laboratories, test plants, and workshops, opportunities are opening up for local people. Take 29-year-old John Black, for example. John is a charge hand in one of the chemical plants. He left school at 15 and started work in his father's small woolen mill. When he came here seven years ago, his whole life changed, and it's still changing where he hopes eventually to take a national certificate in physics and transfer to a scientific grade. The analysis of radioactive samples is all part of John Black's work, and fascinating work it is too. So that was from the Powerhouse 1964. This piece of footage is from a film called Atom Town in 1966. A town quietly proud to be identified with what it sees as its own white-coated research community. A giant crucible of the second industrial revolution helping to secure Britain's place in the new age of science. They've abandoned the bright lights of southern cities, many of them, 
for the excitement of their experiments with the greatest force known to man. They are dedicated men, working to help Britain in the year 2000 and beyond, working in a place geared to the future in the arms of the past. Well, you thought recycled cinema was a new thing. And I think what's really interesting about this is that because these places were so closed and the, you know, the, 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 they couldn't get any more footage, they just didn't have to recycle it. So, in a sense, he, he, he becomes somebody utterly other. He becomes the embodiment of the noble scientist from the South. I actually met the guy, you know, and he's, he, he, he didn't really succeed at Dunray, unfortunately. He became a school janitor. So, you know, I, I was very interested in retrieving elements of people's lives. And, you know, the, the, the kind of the act, you know, people that are used as incidental people, who are they really? I think this was something that was quite important that I was looking for. And sometimes you, you can get a sense of a place which is totally at odds with your expectation of a place. And what do you actually do with that? I might, I might try to show you this very quickly. Let's go full screen just for Normally, if I get, you know, a television crew or, or whatever, I can usually second guess and say, right, is this what you're after? Is that mm. what you're after? Mm. But I can't second guess these mm. guys. I've got mm. an idea of what you're trying mm. to achieve, but yeah. it, it is second guessing. But I think the thing that made it easier for me was when John sent me a uh, copy of his book, yeah. which I found absolutely fascinating. Mm. It was a game, you know, That's uh, a bomb store at an RAF base. And, you know, you, you go in these places, you think, well, what is going on here? What's the secret? And there is no secret. You know, they, they do what they do. You know, the scientists at Dunray are proud of what they did. And how do you actually construct a narrative around that? And the thing about the cul de sac piece was that you had this extraordinary sense of, you know, idyllic nature in this place sort of dedicated to destruction. and. How do you actually combine those two things when you actually make a piece of work? How do you actually do justice to the kind of savagery of the nature of the place and the fact that you're experiencing this kind of strange, calm tranquility? Um, I think one thing that I, I, I do try and do, and particularly in the Dunray pieces, just to let the camera linger a bit in the contemporary footage and just uh, allow some of the, 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 the different ideologies and ideas of the past footage to kind of play out against the solidity of what is now. And this, well, I think, well, we'll just have to have a look and have a wee think about that. Um, I don't, do you want to ask any questions to clarify? Or? Well, I think, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I think um, particularly you're saying the secret is that there is no secret, which is kind of an interesting uh, idea, but um, the nuclear industry, of course, is full of secrets, and it's predicated on s secrets. And there's all kinds of things that we try to keep very secret from from other nations and and uh, and things like that. But perhaps I think the places themselves are are become they become symbolic of something. But there's maybe that's not where it resides. It resides in the people, yeah. don't you think? Or I mean, they're just doing their job. Some of them, and you know the the guy who became emblematic of the industry there working in the controls was mm -hmm. kind of a, a maybe unwilling icon. But uh, where, do, where do the secrets reside then? Just in the people or are the places completely devoid of any well, kind of... Well, I think there's a difference between secrecy 
as we might understand it, as finding the key to knowledge and the security, which is what they're kind of really obsessed with. And I mean, for example, I, I went into the nuclear archive at Harwell, which was, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, you know, you wouldn't get in, and somehow met the guy who's in charge of the archive, and he, his attitude was, the taxpayers paid for this, and so you should see what we did, which is, inside some of these organizations, you can never underestimate the fact that there are going to be, if you, it's just a case of finding the right person. And sometimes if you don't find the right person, you, you actually take a risk of you're going to go in and decide, well, I can't really do anything with this place. I'm just not getting anything real. And the, the key is to try and find the people who haven't had media training and talk to them. That's the, they're the people that are actually going to bring something alive for you if you can actually find them. And it's, finding them can be hard sometimes, and you, you, don't all, you, you can't always do that. Right, so that's that's your advice to other to other artists. Uh, but like, tell us maybe more about getting into these places because it is kind of remarkable. This is something that not everyone uh, can do to get into an air force base to do a project, for example, like you did. Um, but there was pretty specific conditions tied to that, weren't there, with the Cold Salt project? Well, we were able to get in partly because the the whole place was completely obsolete. It was a kind of aircraft that was going to be scrapped in a couple of years' time. They weren't going to use the airbase for anything else. So they were aware that this place was very historical. It was a Second World War base of great renown. And so they, w they perhaps wanted something other than their usual kind of RAF band and parade to kind of mark the end of it. But English Heritage then got in and talked to them about maybe we can get some artists in. And Louise K. Wilson, who's a fantastic artist, works mainly with sound. Previously, she'd done a project on Orford Ness, which is uh, some very obscure nuclear laboratories on the edge of Suffolk. And actually, I'll, I'll show you how I got in the place. I did this piece of work, and I got it here. I was doing a piece of work at a, a country house in Norfolk, and Basically, I could hear the planes every day, extremely loud everywhere, and I couldn't actually see them. So I decided to actually make a mark about linking kind of territoriality with place. So I did a lawn drawing, which is something you would have been very familiar with in Georgian times. You'd have done the king's head or you know the queen's horse on the lawn as a special commemorative thing. So I did this. Here come. It's nearly there.
Oh, the microphone, Gare, sorry. 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 Uh, there was a writer, uh, Rex Werner, who was writing around about the same time as uh, George Orwell. And he wrote this very extraordinary book called The Aerodrome, which was an allegory of fascism. Or, you know, the, the, the aerodrome arrives in the neighborhood and, you know, this kind of peaceful village that splits down the middle and so on. It's a slightly clunky book, but it's very, very poetic and very thoughtful about, you know, the two sides of, if you like, a certain kind of English nature, the kind of ramshackle, easygoing, idyllic, rural versus this, the, the kind of technocratic appeal of a modernist technology. So I just, I just actually thought I'd draw one of the, the aircraft that held Britain in, in threat on the lawn as if it could almost neutralize it by celebrating it in a strange way. And pilots of Coltisol saw it and asked me if I was wanting to come and document it. And I have to say, I was terrified they'd take me off in one of the fast ones because my back, I, I, I'd done my back in and I, I just thought, mercifully, they, they just got up in a little one. So this is, this is how the Coltisol project started. And the cult, th then after that particular kind of closed space, I just thought, well, what, 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 what are the biggest and strangest closed spaces and what are the places I was interested in, and just thought I'd go and knock on the nuclear door, and by some astonishing piece of luck, I did get in. Great. Well, anyway, we're going to see the film later, so people will get to see all about the uh, research you did and the archive work that you did with the Dunre reactor. Um, but for right now, uh, we're going to take a little break, and uh, this will give everybody a chance to you know, go to the bar, get a drink, do all kinds of things, but it's also a chance to interact with the, um, the Papa images uh, through the interface designed by Not Deaf. So what I'm going to do is uh, just hand over the microphone uh, and, let, and let they can explain how it works and what, what, to, what to do, basically, to, uh, to navigate through, through the imagery. So if we can have the team Not Deaf come up here and do a little explanation, that would be fantastic. Hi, I'm uh, Honko, and that's Siba, and we're from Not Deaf here in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, Lino uh, came to us to, and asked us to help her uh, develop an uh, interface or a new website that uh, sort of makes the, the problem we have at the, with the tags. There's a long list of tags. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. There's a long list of tags that um, it's uh, it, it's very disorganized and not uh, uh, and doesn't really tell a story. And we wanted to open up the um, we wanted to open up the images, the the the, the story, the the narrative that that Papa tells. And um, through a, a design we made uh, with synonyms, you um, generate a lot more feedback than only uh, than only one or two results that were linked with one tag so um, if you come to us we'll we'll let you see we'll let have you interact with uh, with with the system it's a work in progress it's a uh, um, it's a system that's um, you know based on a thesaurus open source thesaurus and um, well, we will be glad to answer any questions Great, thanks. So we'll come back in 15 minutes, so at uh, 10 o'clock. Have a drink, have a try, and, uh, and then we'll watch Gare's film. See you in 15 minutes.